start record. We'll get started here in a minute. And I don't know why. Can y'all see me okay? Because it looks like my screen has somebody else and I'm up here in the corner. Yep, we can see you. I can see you. Yes, I can see you too. <clears throat> okay. I don't know that, why this is so weird. I'm doing it on my phone, so it looks different on here. Let's see. All right, we'll let everybody get in. Well, hey, hey, so it's seven o'clock central, so I'm going to go ahead and start while everybody else is like hopping in. Um, Y'all cannot believe we have like 50 something people in here right at seven. I've done Zoom calls before and usually I'm sitting here waiting um, five or seven minutes for everybody to get on here. So, but I did know that if you didn't get on here right away, we had probably 600 people sign up on the email list to get this call. So I did know that if they weren't on here right away, they probably wouldn't get in, but we're recording it. And I'm just making sure it's recorded so that you guys can have it and we can send it out in the email. Um, I was just gonna introduce myself. I'm Carrie Foster with Foster Fast Pitch. I've been teaching for a little over 20 years. We're gonna celebrate our 20 year anniversary this year. I'm so excited. Um, I spent the weekend going to watch a lot of my college kids play. We had, um, I had some kids in New York coming down, um, playing with their school, down here playing at Stanford. Um, we had Mississippi College playing Montevallo, my Auburn kids playing my Alabama. Um, so it was a busy week going back and forth, watching the kids play and it was exciting. So um, <clears throat> with that being said, um, I'm located here in McCullough, Alabama. It's in, in Birmingham. So if you ever come here, you're, you're coming to Birmingham. I'm a little bit outside of Birmingham. And um, I played at a division one here um, at University of Alabama, Birmingham. And I loved it. Started teaching actually when I was in high school. And um, I love that I'm going to talk about the hello elbow versus internal rotation tonight because I started off um, with palm out, lock the elbow, snap the wrist. That's how I was originally taught. And over time and through a lot of injuries, um, relearned how to pitch this way and I absolutely love it. This is what I teach. Um, still looking at making sure everybody can get in on time. So um, <clears throat> I've had several, several kids um, play, I think over 100 kids play in college, and I've had three in the NPF and um, tons of little ones. So we start from age six, and we work with kids all the way through college and um, so on. So that is a little bit about our history. I'm actually doing a Hall of Fame wall on our wall. So when kids walk in, they can see everybody that has been through the program and played in college. And I think it's kind of exciting. So we're getting that wall put up. And if you didn't know, no, this gym is actually in my basement. So when people come here for intensives or weekends, they drive up and they're like, we're at a house. I'm like, yes, there's not a building. You just walk around the back and you're in my basement. So um, I love the fact that I was able to create this space for my kids. Um, very homey and um, they can be here in my home training with me and my daughter can be upstairs. I'm a single mom. So um, I love having my daughter here and not having to be at a gym all the time. So um, with that being said, we're going to, um, if you are in the academy, I'd love to know um, if you're in the academy, the online program that I have put in the comments, I'm in there. Um, I'd love to know. And then also, if you're not already on the email list, we're going to put a link in here or either you'll be able to, um, I guess all of you are probably on the email list now because you've signed up for this, but we have the insiders list. So just make sure you share that. We love um, being able to share information with you guys 
on that. All right, so um, if you're in the academy, you know that I start off the academy with three components to the foundation of pitching. Um, I think a lot of times instructors know how to um, pitch. They just don't know how to create the foundation. They just start them off with snaps, nine o'clock, so like three drills and let's pitch. And they end up pitching for an hour. And so they never create the solid foundation they need to actually build strength, power, accuracy, and speed. Um, they don't build that into their knowledge, clarity, how they warm up, um, what their, their goals and what they're trying to attain. They just start pitching. And a lot of coaches don't really know how to start off um, pitchers, and they don't know how to start off little ones, especially, or a new kid. And um, so I've created that space so that you guys can know the foundation of pitching. Even if you've been to one instructor, three instructors, you can get in there and you can look at the foundation. You can say, oh, we did that, but we didn't do that. I know that, but I don't know that. And it kind of is what I call fill in the gaps um, with maybe what you know and then maybe what you're missing. Why can't I get accuracy? Why can't I um, get faster? Why have I plateaued? Why are we not using our legs? Um, why is our curve rise, whatever, not working? It all will make sense if you understand the foundation. So everything I teach is based on this foundation. And in that foundation, there's three components. We're going over one of them today. You have arm whip to release, which is what I call unravel. You have sequencing and you have ground force, um, power and momentum. And so basically we're going over arm whip. And what does that consist of? Because most of you guys, um, um, have been taught, or most of the kids, I have never in my 20 years had anybody that come in here and did this, um, but they've always started here. They've also all uh, started sideways on the power line, wrist cocked back, and then snapping. And most of them don't even snap, they just throw. They're just tossing the ball to the catcher, then they come back to nine, and they do the same thing, their elbows locked, and then they throw, or either they step and throw, most of the time they step out, drag out. And so um, what I was taught when I was younger was this um, elbow locked, wrist cocked back, um, step and drag. You wanna clear your hip. You wanna let your hand come through, snap it at the bottom of your circle, let your foot drag out, or maybe even more like a figure four. And a lot of things have changed um, over the years. And now that we have 4D motion, we have technology, um, we understand the science behind hitting. And this really kind of started more in the baseball world of understanding hitting and everything going to straight technology, how they teach and um, read batters and all the things. And then it developed and evolved into softball and taking 70 mile an hour pitchers and saying, how do they throw so hard? And that's why you're seeing pitchers get faster and faster and faster every year. Um, however, my um, change actually happened in college because I had a um, L4, L5 herniation, also labrum and the rotator cuff tear. I did not want to have surgery. Thank goodness I didn't have to rehab my shoulder back and then change the way that I threw. And so what really happened was I took, uh, we took a physical therapist and my pitching coach and we kind of combined it and we said, she cannot rotate like she's rotating anymore. So basically I was pushing and I was told to get open to a power X, land in this position, and then pull through. And you just really rip through and follow through. And so what we figured out was when I was pushing out and landing in this position, um, I had this arched back. And then I was planted like in cement and I was resisting. And I was using my back to twist and pull a hundred and something pounds behind me. And so if you think about any kind of squat, um, if I was doing a full rack squat, I wouldn't land or go down in this position. You're always supposed to have a straight spine, tuck your core in, engage your stomach, and then do your squat. Well, I was landing in a pelvic tilt and then twisting on that, which was causing, and it caused um, the other two pitchers to have um, a broken spine. And so from that, I was the only one that didn't have a broken spine, but herniated my disc, and we started working on driving out. And landing in this position, in this position, also my knee stopped hurting because I wasn't landing in that position and not having any mobility in my knee. So I was landing in a 45 degree angle. My knees were soft and I could engage my core when I out. 
And so in that position, we learned that I had to pitch more in a straight on position. Then we learned that my shoulder and hip would open me without me trying to have to over open at the beginning. And it allowed me to really drive out, land in a safe um, position. And then I realized my hand and my arm speed was getting faster, getting four, four to five miles an hour. And I was throwing in the high 60s after the injury and re redoing my form. At that time, we really didn't know why all the things were happening. I just knew that I was throwing better, I was more accurate, and became a better pitcher, and I had no pain. And so for years after that, I started teaching this, and I was actually known as the pitching coach that got kids faster, but also one that would help their back and shoulders not hurt. And so it wasn't until over the last seven to eight years, we've started really seeing more of this internal rotation talk on Instagram, but it's actually been around for a long time. And surprisingly, um, and y'all can add questions to the chat. Hopefully my assistant will be on here later and she can kind of run through these with me as well. So, um, but we, um, about set, uh, oh, what I was gonna say is at the, if you actually slow down a lot of pitchers or say you're a pitcher and um, they're here, you think they're here in their drills. But when they go to pitch, if you slow them down, more than likely they're plumb up. This is a natural position for the body. So as they push out, whether their ball is down or their ball is in or their ball is up, it's more of a natural position to be here than to try to turn the hand, turn the elbow and turn the shoulder. And so you'll see just in that one positioning, keeping that palm in and up, that the arm's gonna move a lot smoother and, and straighter. And when it does, you're gonna see that the arm speed will increase. If you have a program called like 4D Motion, which we have here, you can see um, the difference in speed based on all of the adjustments that you make, whether it be not rocking back, whether it be just ground force driving, whether it be not dropping, just driving out, hand position, we can see all the little adjustments and then how it increases your speed. And in this one component, this has been huge. And so um, when we go back to talking about, um, they call it hello elbow, I just call it palm out at nine o'clock because that's what we were taught. Um, you're taught elbow locked here, snap, elbow locked here, wrist cocked back so you can get a full snap. Um, one thing with that is you don't really learn to spin the ball. You spin, you, you use your wrist more than you do your fingers. So then when you go into um, learning pitches, their fingers aren't really doing anything. I call them like they're paralyzed and the wrist is trying to spin all the pitches and they can't. And then they don't know how to spin the pitch because they don't know how to not snap. And then therefore they push it or they can't create spin. So it just uh, evolves over a lot of issues. Um, but in injury prevention, the reason that we don't do this anymore is a lot of times, once they get here, what happens is you're going to see the foot drag out. And we talked about the shoulder and the hip turning. Now, we call that a shoulder hip pitcher. You should be a hip shoulder pitcher. And so when you get here and land and then pull through with your, uh, your shoulder and your elbows locked, your hand is behind the ball, you're going to have to come behind and under the ball. And then you're going to lift your elbow and pull up. And a lot of times you're getting a pushed ball instead of a, a, a spinning ball. You're not getting that top spin that's going to create a lot more spin, a lot more speed. You're going to end up pushing the ball. The ball's going to tend to go high. Um, you're not going to have as much accuracy. Not only that is when you start getting here and you become a shoulder pitcher, um, because you're not allowing the lat to engage and the elbow to be pulled down. So what happens is the anterior or the, the front of the shoulder, the, the rotator cuff starts to work. And you'll see this in a lot of pictures. So if you do this and you have them hold on and you tell them to turn their shoulder and lean and pull, you'll feel, you'll, they'll feel the front of their shoulder pulling. So no longer are you engaging your back and your glutes to actually throw your, all the pressures put into your shoulder and then you end up locking your elbow which ends up causing a hinge so they start pulling and shortening their arm a lot of bicep tendonitis and a lot of accuracy issues and you're going to lose the arm whip which is that downward fall you want to snap at the bottom of your circle and so you want to lead with the elbow and have that pop like a whip and that's what brings a lot of the speed um let me backtrack a little bit because we're not talking sequencing here 
But if you don't sequence properly, then it's going to be very hard to get in this position. So we're just learning the upper body and understanding why there needs to be a change. Um, but if you don't sequence properly, then the, the elbow getting in this position will be very difficult. And that's all in the academy. If you want this kind of training, it's in the, in the academy for the rest. I just don't have time for it tonight. But when you actually sequence resist and the hip starts to lead, we call it a linear sequencing. So the heel goes down, um, resistance. So all the energy going into the floor creates energy coming back, creates a knee turn, a hip turn. Once the hip turns, it pulls the serratus anterior, the lat, the tricep, and then down into the fingers. That process, that string being pulled through the body creates power that will be released through the hand. That is called power, ground force power, sequencing power, that's gonna allow them to throw effortlessly without trying to manufacture or create power within their body, which will create injuries. Another thing is if you don't sequence properly and into that whip, um, at any point the sequencing breaks down, then we call it leaking force. So say you land and the hips, the hips don't turn, the knee turns, but they don't turn their hips. Then what happens is the shoulder will start to compensate. And so at this hinging point, they lose all the power. They just try to manufacture from the ground. They lost it and have to redo it through their upper body. Wherever they leap force is going to be a point of injury. Um, some people may get all the way through the sequencing and then rotate their shoulder. And then that's where the injuries happen here too. So sequencing, sequencing is huge for um, getting into that arm whip position. Um, but the main reason we don't do this, not only just accuracy problem, is because it leads to a lot of pressure on the shoulder and a lot of pulling through the elbow. Um, so you're going to get shoulder injuries, elbow injuries, and a lot of back injuries thrown their way because the way that you have to, usually when people teach this, they're not teaching sequencing. It's more of that get open early, get the hips open, clear the hips. When we just said that the hips aren't cleared, the hips actually lead the elbow into that positioning and snap. So you will finish brushing by that, that side um, as you snap. But I, as you see with my shoulder in, I have a clear spot for my hand to come through in a straight line as long as my shoulders stay in. I go through all of that in the academy. So, um, but going back to the arm whip, when you're here, um, you're going to start with your ball up and come down to the uh, down to the leg. At the leg, you're leading with the pinky. So as if you're throwing a rise or a curveball, you're going to or screw ball, or drop. This is how you're going to throw all your pitches. You'll never throw a pitch off of this. So it's the only pitch that if you do throw, you'll throw like that. Um, so when you come down here, the only difference is finger positioning. And so when I get here now, I'll let the ball roll off my fingertips, a squeeze in the forearm. And in that external to internal rotation is where you get that arm lift. Never try to rotate the hand in on a snap. You're going to end up getting a changeup or a drop ball or something that's not very powerful. You're still, you're just snapping through the pitch. You're just allowing the elbow and the hand to lead um, that ball as you come through. Um, I'm trying to think if there's something else before I go to questions. Um, I will say this, that um, we're going to send an email out with the Zoom call. You're going to get a discount to get into the academy. You're going to have drills associated with how to fix this. Um, you're also, um, the first 20 people I think that get in will get a program for four weeks. And it's going to have a special video for you guys that's not in the academy. Um, I filmed it this week. And it's step by step how to make that change and how to make that adjustment. And then you'll also be having that discount into the academy that's going to give you the information about sequencing. So you'll have everything you need to know for practically nothing. Um, I think it's $57 a month. So you're going to get all the videos, the whole foundation. You get everything I actually teach, every pitch if you wanted it. But just getting the foundation and getting the video that I'm going to send to you and getting that four week program that's not in the academy is huge. So if you're seriously wanting to change into this, um, do it. So I, um, I think you'll get an email right after this and you can jump in. Like I said, the first 20 get that program. Um, but I will say this, um, questions. I know I'm going to get, um, how long does it take to transition? I feel like it doesn't take very long. I can transition somebody in one session. And the reason I say that is because it's really about clarity. They naturally do it anyway. A lot of times I will film them and then I teach them and I say, look, you're already, you're doing this naturally. 
So what you're doing in your drills does not match what you're doing when you pitch. So let's match what you do when you pitch. What do you do when you pitch? I show them the video and they're like this. And so I let them, the hardest component is actually transitioning that brain to, oh, I'm not doing this. And then they're thinking, oh, I lost my power. Oh, I don't know how to snap. No, you're not controlling your snap anymore. You're not forcing your snap anymore. You're just allowing yourself to feel the pitch for the first time. You're starting to feel the arm drop. You're starting to feel the arm stay nice and loose. You're starting to feel your fingers spin the ball. But when you're tight and you're trying to pull and muscle and manufacture power, injuries, um, you're pulling, you're going to have height issues, uh, you're going to lose a lot of speed. So the changing process can be one day to a couple of weeks. Um, and I do it in the middle of season with my kids because I feel like they're going to get in the game. And they're going to do whatever they want to anyway. Even if they had it perfect, they won in here. They're still going to get in the game and do what they want to because just their subconscious takes over, which is a good thing. And they're just going to pitch, be a gamer and do their thing. So it, doing these drills are, will eventually evolve. So the training process, the understanding process is easy. Getting them to eventually trust the process, which is the mental part, is the longest part, I feel like. Um, so you just have to be patient. Um, parents, coaches, players, you just have to be patient with that trust process. Um, I'm going to jump into some chat because I know I'll probably explain a little bit more when we get in there. So. Um, I love that. So Sloan, you said, is it a natural screwball spin when you do it? I don't prefer that. However, it can, it can do that. And it's not a screwball spin. It's a bullet. So it comes in like a bullet. You know how a bullet goes fast, but it spins this way. And what happens is when they come through and they're in this position, it just rolls off the side as they come through. Um, totally fine. I don't prefer it. So I always try to change it. I would rather have top spin. And so what happens is when they come through here, um, I want to make sure that the ball rolls off all three fingers before it comes through. Um, if they don't and they come through and just spin it, then it will it will do that. And I think it can veer a little bit on the pitch so it's not as straight. And um, But for that reason, I would put a spinner in their hand, allow the back of the hand come through, and then snap so they can see and feel all three fingers coming through at the same time. Um, I feel like that's another challenge when you're working spins because a lot of them have just been here just pitching. So they have to have what we call proprioception. The younger they are, the less they have. And so you're trying to make them very aware of what they're feeling in their hands um, when they're feeling the ball come through and being able to spin the ball at an early age versus push the ball. And then it's going to make learning the spin pitches very easy. Um, but with that being said, when they're here, they're going to be pushing. So they're not feeling the same. So when they're here, they're going to have to feel the ball roll off the tips and then snap. And um, so I just encourage them, even when they're here, just to get that, that full finger pull off that ball. Um, when they're in this position, if they're down and spin back, it's a rise ball. They push their three fingers forward. It's a fastball. If they're down here and they lift their hand up and spin their fingers, is a curve. So you, in the transition of this, you could get any of those pitches um, because they're so similar. Uh, they just don't have the proprioception to really fill it. So you have to put them in that position with the spinner of football. Um, I have a lot of those drills in the academy so they can fill it. So if y'all have any more questions, y'all can keep putting them up here and I'll, I'll look at them. Um, for sequencing, is it better for a girl to rock down with her arms or just explode on the reach? So I think what you're referring to is what I would call ground force and momentum, which is the third part of the foundation. And I don't care either one. I think what you've got to look for is that when their toe hits the ground, their arm is stopping and they have their knee over the toe, nose over uh, knee, and they're getting that good push. So we call it a shin angle where the knee is over the toe. And from that position, they want to be able to transfer energy from back to front foot. Um, and a lot of times when they swing back and rock to the back foot and then they come forward, their hips are not bent, they're not loaded, they don't have chin angles. So a lot of those things um, don't happen, but it is possible. So there's just some checkpoints that I mentioned in the academy to make sure you're looking for for them to get maximum speed and push off the, um, the mound. <clears throat> 
No, you don't hold the threads differently. I still hold um, a four seam. So I always put my finger underneath. I tuck it underneath. If they have a small hand, then they can put it on the side. Fingertips are on the same, thumbs on the back. And then these, the middle finger and thumb is lined up in a line. Um, should a pitcher see a pitching coach in addition to the academy? What should we look for in a pitching coach? That's a good question. I love that um, people still go to a pitching coach and an academy. Here's the thing. I don't feel like um, a lot of pitching coaches teach this nowadays. Um, and so I think it's going to be a, a, a challenge. If you can't find one that is similar, I probably wouldn't go to one, in my opinion. It's not going to be beneficial just to go to one for them to teach something different or tell her something different. In my opinion, if you're not going to an internal rotation coach, um, I have several that I can recommend. I have, um, I think, eight in my coaching certification program right now. I have over 50 that I've worked with. And then I'll open it back up in July and I'll have more. So they'll be on my website. You can look for and see if there's one near you. Um, but, um, I feel like it's not taught much, but the ones that are teaching or learning it or will are willing to be in the academy would be a great partnership. Um, but I prefer the parent or coach because you are the bear or, uh, or the travel ball coach or whoever's um, the coach. You are their best coach and they are their best coach. So them learning it themselves with the coach, their parent or the travel ball coach or whatever is the best scenario. Um, and then can do uh, video analysis or anything like that in the academy you get discounted video analysis and I can look at it and tell you um, what's good what you need to work on send it back later I can tell you hey you're, you're getting this or you're not getting this we also have a live chat in there where you can throw up videos and parents and coaches other people that are learning with you can help you too and can promote other drills that we have in there that's really helped their child so I love that component of it um is the academy appropriate for beginning pitchers? Does it give me uh, progression? Yes. So it, like I said, it's it's um, you'll get an email and it's it actually has a um, video to teach you how to use Facebook basically because a lot of people don't know all the ins and outs of Facebook. Once you get that video, if you're on your phone, you go to the three lines at the top and hit guides and you start in guide one and it shows you how to use it. Guide two starts the foundational system. Most people, that's where they stay for a long time. And there's a four week program there. If you get in the academy, I think in the next, the first 20 people, you'll get a four week program that's not in the academy. Um, and it's gonna be a special video with all the drills on how to fix this. Um, it's gonna be how I teach it with clarity, drill and pitch and how to integrate it into the pitch. You're gonna get all of that. Um, so you, it should be very easy for you to make that transition. And then you can just throw videos into the chat, see how your progression is going. And if you need any information from me, you can chat with me in that group as well. Um, how can I set up in-person lessons with you? On my website, I have, um, it's called intensives. So you can look at that with the, um, with the intensives, it's a minimum of three one hour sessions. I think there are 130 and um, has a hotel that you can stay at and you can hear well you just email me the email that's on the the website and we'll schedule a weekend that works for you a lot of kids will come in and do an hour or two on friday and then an hour or two on saturday and then go back out they'll fly and fly out or drop and drop. um and then we can do that too i will say i'll be in 10 different cities in the next six months um i know i'm going to be in orlando houston um yorktown virginia greenville south carolina new jersey um, it's an hour away from New York City. I know that. I don't know the name of it. It starts with a P. It's a weird name. Um, I'm going to be in Salt Lake City next month, Vegas, and that's all that. I'm, Franklin, Tennessee. So if you're near any of those, I will be listing all of those on the internet. I mean, on my website and on Instagram, um, where you may can join one of those as well. Um, do you have to pay? Yes. Um, the Academy is only 57 a month. So it's actually the cost of one personal session with me if you were in a group training. So you're getting um, years and years and years of training and all of my information. There's over, I think, oh God, 40 guides and 400 videos. Um, so you have everything I can completely answer for you. And you have programs and you have an arm care program and you have a mobility program. You have anything you need in there. Um, the biggest thing is just get in there and start learning and start understanding. 
Um, Southern California. I'm not for sure of one in Southern California. Let me, let me look. I may have had one, but I don't know if she's in Southern California. Message me on Instagram. Um, shout out, started with one year instructors last month, already seeing a difference in my daughter's action speed. That's awesome. Please tell me who you started with. That's awesome. I love it. Um, yes, I will be in, oh, it must be Madison. And um, that's where I'm, I'm going to be in June. Um, Colorado. I'm not for sure about, yes, yes, I have, I did work with somebody in Colorado, message me on Instagram, I'll, I'll find, remember who it is, um, if the ball is coming out, thumb and index finger, how do you correct, thumb, and it, oh, so is it like a, Sloan, is it like a screw ball, yay, I'm glad you're going to be there, make sure you say that you're on this call with me, Eastern New York. How far are you from New Jersey? If you'll message me, I'll tell you who I'm working with in New Jersey. Um, okay, so Sloan, I guess you're talking about this here. And so what it is, is I, I would probably um, maybe even take two fingers and a thumb and make them come through here. The biggest thing is getting the back of the hand to the thigh and then snapping through with the fingers. So when they're getting here, take two fingers so they're not twisting and tell them to put their two, their thumb through the two fingers. Um, and then they wouldn't be coming off to the side and just make them touch the fingers when they get done. T tell my baby shark, got to touch baby shark. Um, how far are you from, there's two coaches in Houston that I would recommend. Um, one is softball doctor. She's actually known as a hitting coach, but she's personally worked with me. And then there's Kristen, and I forgot her last name, and she's local to Houston as well. Um, I can get you can message me and I give you their information. How important is it for the arm to be relaxed or the wrist? For, yes, it's so important. Well, pitching in general, think about if you have a fist, you can't move it. And if you have a loose fist, you can really move it. So the, the whole point, if you watch college pitchers, you see them just like do this at the end. It's because they're getting that complete whip. Yes, you feel the fingers come through, but it's just like overhand throwing. When you come through, you're not pushing. You're not back here and then pulling and then snapping. You're, it's actually internal to external rotation here as well. And then you have that internal rotation at the end. So it's, it's, it's like a loose wrist. Anytime you do anything, if I play pickleball, I play tennis, everything, they're like loose wrists. You want it to just internally rotate and fall through. Um, Everything you do is is external to internal rotation if you're getting whip or power. So you really want everything very nice and loose. So when they get here, uh, I, one thing I tell my kids is just wiggle, 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 and then just drop your hand and feel it. And once they get resistance, they're not trying to create power from here. Power comes from the ground. So once that, that ground force power and that sequencing happens, the deceleration part is what you want to be very fast. And you it's not going to be fast if you're tensing up or if you're trying to throw hard. One of the worst things you can do is tell them to throw hard. Throw hard, throw fast, throw hard, throw fast, because they're just going to tense up and try to muscle up and try to throw. Just be quick and efficient. Be quick. Just be quick and loose, quick and loose. And that's what you're going to see generate more power than try to throw hard. Um, Melissa, just message me and I'll send you a link um for the coaches that gets um yeah that gets recommended um I have a big coaches group that I have um it's a it's a certification thing that I have my daughter keeps hitting her thigh when throwing her pitch okay so you want to hit the thigh but here's the difference in hitting hip and hitting thigh I always say hitting hip but um the back of the hand to hit the thigh the elbow is going to be close inside. So the elbow is going to be kind of up here in the ribs. The only problem you're going to have, and this is good for pitching coaches that's here too, we have kids hit their hip, bruise their hip, elbow hit the hip. Most of the time they have really long arms and their hip, their elbow is right hitting the hip bone. It's like they just happen to be at the same place. When I stand up, my elbow is way up here. So at that point, I've only had three or four in the 20 years that I've coached that end up being like that. So there's minor adjustments we make. But for the most part, you want, to hear that the back of the hand tells you when to release the ball it just falls right into the slot um the when it's a problem is when the shoulder flies out so when they land and they become a shoulder pitcher then they they what happens is the hip and elbow come through at the same time 
you want the shoulder to stay in, the hip to rotate, then the hand to slide by on the side. So now it has a nice loose um, arm, arm spot slide coming through. I have a big video on Instagram um, about that. I think it was one of the ones where I was on the green turf um, about a year ago. And just showing how you create space by keeping the shoulder in and allowing the hip to pull the arm through. But the moment that the shoulder flies out is the moment you get stuck behind the hip. Um, not only that, sometimes the arm going out or if they open up early and the arm goes out, then you'll see that this arm goes back behind them and then they pull the hip through and then that's not a good situation either. So you have to really look at that arm circle. Um, Someone who's a local rec ball, possible new travel coach, what would be one or two main tips to make sure I am working on this right? I do try to model arm. Um, so um, Amber, I would say if you're gonna actually get in coaching, make sure you understand what you're teaching. Um, so I would probably be in the academy just because you wanna make sure all your ducks in a row before you start teaching a kid something and actually teach them something wrong. Uh, I, I'm very, um, I guess a component of that because we have coaches all over teaching kids wrong, taking their money and then they don't do the training themselves to really keep up with the times. And then, then they come to me and all I hear is I wasted three years of my life. I wasted all this money and it just becomes a big issue. So if you're actually going to start training or working with kids or teaching kids, I would really get to, to learning and knowing it. It's 57 a month. I mean, it's, one lesson, if you taught a lesson, it's one lesson that you would get, you know, it would pay for itself. So, um, but with nuggets would be, um, make sure that when they're teaching, when you're teaching the snap, the palm is up, back of the hand brushes, their shoulders in, knees turned, they're at a 45 degree angle with their feet and they're allowing the fingers to drop down and snap through the pitch and the arm to stay nice and loose. Um, palm is up at nine o'clock and then coming through. That's really as simple as it is. I do have tons of drills that in there that will, will teach you because you'll have tons of kids that do it kind of differently or have a little weird issue or they don't understand. And you'll have to have that information to really relate to them and clarify and help them make that transition. Um, and plus the program will be very beneficial to learning just that first component of the foundation. Um, but the biggest thing is just making sure that the palm is up, back of the hand is on the thigh, and they're feeling the ball roll off their fingertips. Um, Warm-up stretches and suggestions. I will say this, I, in the academy, I have a arm care program, mobility care program. I would do that. Um, I had a therapist write that for you guys. Um, I personally uh, grew up, you know, doing the whole one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stretching. Nowadays, this is not my, I guess, area of expertise, but I do know that they're doing more active stretching than static stretching. So it's more of stretching through movement um, and pressure versus actual stretching an arm. So we do have that program in the academy and we do some with um, a PVC pipe, um, but everything is through mobility and stretching. And then there's some band work in there as well. A lot of people do banded stretch work. So basically like a small rehab program and then a program at the end, um, arm care program with resistance to, to fatigue the shoulder and get the lactic acid out. So it don't build up, cause knots and tightness and stuff like that. So um, physical therapist is really where I'd go with that information, but we do have something in the academy for that. I just can't remember all of it. I know I have it in there though. Um, bowling, sliding my back foot, any advice? Um, so the, the back foot bowling is a sequencing issue. And like I said, I'm not going to get too much in that because we're really just talking about, you know, um, arm whip stuff. But if you're bowling this, the sequencing issue is, is so in depth. I could talk on it for two hours. Um, but you bowling has to do with the way that you land either forward or backward, not landing properly. And then, but now you can't resist, but it has to do with resistance. And then from resistance, are you sequencing correctly? Is your knee turning? Is your hip turning? Is it leading? Is your, are your shoulders staying in? Are you creating separation? Um, I have a video in the guide too, under sequencing one's resistance, how to get the kid to resist. And then also the um, separation, which is that shoulder in while the hip turns. That's the hardest thing to teach. 
and it's the hardest thing to get them to do, but we do it hitting all the time. We step, we turn, then we hit. And we don't step and just swing with our hips moving. And it's what brings bat power, brings the bat whip, and it's what brings power. And so you do it throwing, you do it volleyball, you do it golf. For some, for some reason, people are not doing it while they're pitching. And so it prevents a lot. I mean, I'm going to say eight to 10 miles an hour while they're not gaining speed because they don't know how to sequence. And so if you're bowling, you don't know how to sequence. And so you would have to watch that video because it's a numerous of things that it could be doing. I would just say that is where you would need to start. Um, general um, what advice would you give in general terms of what to tell a pitcher during a mound visit when they're struggling? I'm sure they are just tired of hearing the and say, it's okay, throw strikes. I love that. Um, uh, let me see, see this, Philadelphia, South Jersey, or Delaware. South Jer uh, Jersey is where I'm going. If you'll message me on Instagram, I'll tell you where I'm going. I can't remember the name of it. It's Harley, and I can't remember her last name. Um... Los Angeles, California, Long Beach, California. Again, message me and um, I'll send you some information. I don't know if they're in that particular part of California. So, um, but let's get back to advice that you would give in general to term um, kids that's struggling on the mound. So one thing you've got to realize when you go out on the mound, one, I, I love to say, it's like raising children. Um, you raise one child, you can scream at them. The other one, you have to beat them. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you can't scream at one. You have to talk to them loving. You could raise your voice and she's going to cry. The other one, you feel like you just have to beat to get them to act right. Um, but every picture is going to be so, something different. And knowing their love language and knowing um, what gets them motivated and doesn't tear them down is going to be number one. Um, addressing your cool, your temper, your, your sternness, your facial expressions when you come out there. One, they need to know you are for them. Um, and I mean, I don't think any pitcher is going to get out there and you need to discipline them. Um, they're trying. They're not trying to look stupid in front of all the people. They're already humiliated or embarrassed enough if they're struggling. Um, so the amount of pressure that's on a pitcher in those situations is almost unbearable sometimes. I was watching Alabama play and Auburn play today and just sometimes the the fans and the um, the pressure and the loudness and the national TV and all that. I mean, I just, I don't even know how I handled that. I handled it, but I mean, I looking back, I'm like, how do we even handle that? So um, also knowing that sometimes they're going to have to get in the car and hear daddy or mama sometimes cuss them out, sometimes get around them or, you know, you never know what they deal with when they get back in the car. So you don't know truly what's going on in their mind. Um, so I think knowing that when, that when you come out there you're in a game, you've got to motivate them. They've got to pull something from within to make something happen. Um, a lot of athletes that just adrenaline's going and you're like, oh, she's a gamer. A lot of times that's because they're just like, they're in a game. They're not thinking about anything. Their athleticism just turns over and they become a better athlete, um, because they relax and all the training they've done, they, they allow the training they've done to come through. Um, the kids that overanalyze or are um, scared or throw a little fearful or doubtful or insecure, they're going to remain in that, that I'm trying to do everything, be perfect mode. Um, so you kind of just have to know your, your athlete, but I would just really encourage them. Hey, this is not the end of the world. You know, <laughs> this is not life or death. You're doing a great job. Some days are great. Some days are not. But I want you to do this. I want you to focus on this. I want you to give them one thing to clear their mind and really focus. And another bit of advice that's helped that I, I learned later in life, but I use it in my pickleball and tennis now, is um, it's a book called Five, Four, Three, Two, One, Go. And it gets them from the emotional side of the brain into the logical side of the brain. And um, so before when they I kind of would always mess up when I would serve, I'd get like anxious or don't hit the ball out or whatever. And, and I would just bounce the ball and I would say five, four, three, two, one, go five, four, three, two, one, go five, four, three, two, one, go. Then step on the mound, take a deep breath. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And then go. Because what happens is it gets them out of that emotional like, oh, my gosh, you just hit the um, 
the ball out or I just made an error or somebody's yelling at me. It gets them into that logical sense and not emotional. And they're, so they're not an emotional pitcher. Um, plus, as soon as something happens, like a ball gets hit over the fence, five, four, three, two, one, go. Your brain has five seconds before it goes from logical to emotional. And if you get it back into logical before it gets into emotional, then um, then they probably won't get into that headspace of just, you know, losing it on the mound and getting because we're emotional players, men are mental players. And so we've got hormones, we've got emotions, we've got all this stuff going on. So keeping them in that logical um, frame and numbers and five, four, you know, five, four, three, one, two, one, go and processing <clears throat> gets them out of emotional. So hopefully some of that may help you too. Dallas, I don't know anybody in Dallas. I do know Houston though. Is internal rotation the same as whip and a forearm fire? Yes, pretty much so. I mean, everybody's got their little name for it, um, but it's just, and, and people that do this with their elbow and palm out, it's called hello elbow. I don't know, I mean, they've never really had names until recently, but forearm fire, arm whip, all, all of it's uh, the same. A pitcher with naturally rounded in shoulders, how can that affect her IR and any? Okay, so I don't know a whole lot about naturally rotated in, but I will say I'm the same way. Like I stand a little bit more like this, and but mine's from years of pitching like this and, and chest work and core work and lifting. I didn't do enough back um, exercises, so I'm weak in my back and I'm very strong here. And the front of my neck and the shoulders really pull my shoulders forward. So I do a lot of massage therapy, uh, muscular release. I do a lot of rolling and then a lot of posture um, therapy um, every time I work out. And I still get massage therapy about every two weeks. Um, I don't do chest. I don't do push-ups anymore. Very rarely do I do push-ups. I do everything back and I don't do chest um, because we already start doing this on everything and we never do this so I think a lot of times internally rotated shoulders is from the way that we've developed through bad habits looking at phones all the other things so developing a plan where you can work on your shoulders we have that mobility plan and um, strengthening plan in the academy I would do those get that back um, tightened up and back and get all this loosened up with some massage therapy rolling um, and stretching techniques um, so unless there's just more of an issue that I don't know about, like medical condition that I'm not sure about, then I wouldn't know how to answer that. But that's the best way I know how to answer that. Um, Coleman. I think in Coleman, no, I have a lot of kids from Coleman and Huntsville that come here. Um, I would probably say there's a guy, it's um, Shelby, Shelby Lowe from Auburn. Her dad is somewhere close that way. I don't know if Mike um, Willis teaches in Huntsville. I taught both of his kids. He may teach. I don't, I'm not for sure. Um, but most of my kids that are from there will come once or twice a month and then they're in the academy as well. So I'm, I'm a touch point once a week. I give them what to work on. They study in the academy. They come back. So most of my kids from the area will come here. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I've been wanting to come to Canada. And too much. I had some in Ontario ask me to come up, but I haven't followed back up with them. Um, do you offer virtual assessments? Yes. I only do that with kids in the academy because I have so many. I can't do them for everybody on Instagram, social media. But if you're in the academy, we do offer virtual assessments and um, video analysis. Yes. So I can work with you on that. Just shoot me a message and we'll get you in the academy. And we can start with a um, uh, analysis. You can shoot me some videos in the academy. If you're in there, there is a start here button. Look there for all the information about uh, virtual sessions or video analysis. Um, same, same for a regular. You still grab the four seam um, for the grip. Alberta. I don't know where the. I don't know if that's anywhere close. But I will come to Canada. I've been wanting to come to Canada. Um, we can get something scheduled in the fall if you want to. Ohio. I'll have to look. You can message me on Instagram. All right. I'm going to wrap this up in just a second. If you guys don't have any other questions, just don't forget that 
I hope this was informative enough for you guys to decide whether you want to do this or not. Um, obviously, it's something that I'm pretty adamant on. I, um, I mean, obviously, you can do this. I think you're going to plateau. I think you're also going to cause a lot of injuries, and I think you're going to struggle um, for a while. And it's going to be hard for you to get in these positions to throw your pitches. So I think it's a good – any time's a good time to start changing. Um, and any time's a good time to start learning. And so um, at the end of this call, you guys will get that email with the academy information. You'll also, like I said, the first 20 will get a program that will program you through that transition, a you know, four-week program um, that takes you through drills that I do not have in the academy. You're going to get all that in the email. So um, if you have any more questions, I'll take those right now before we end. Do you feel like the academy alone can teach? Yes. Yes, it can. Between that and video analysis, if you need them, um, perfect example, I showed a picture um, uh, of a lady that is in the academy, her and her daughter, and she's about nine, and they live on a farm out, they homeschool. Um, I think she's in a local system where she teaches, and her mom has done phenomenal with her. I mean, I posted on Instagram, I couldn't be happier. Um, it just shows that the program works because a mom that's never played softball could watch a video and it's just like a puzzle. It's putting the puzzle together. Like, this is what you're looking for. This is what we're doing. Okay, you don't look like that video. Okay, so we need to make you look like the video. It is super simple. It's putting a puzzle together. You look at a video, you make your child do what the video says, and then you just follow the directions. It's super easy. Any parent, any coach can do it. Um, you just have to have the information and the time to put into it to really invest into your daughter. So if this is something you want to do and there's not like a local pitching coach, this is super easy. <laughs> and actually, if I was to go back and do this, I would probably rather be doing my pitching lesson from home than traveling every week or hours a week to go to a pitching coach. So I probably would do it anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's no, there's no better time than now to just start learning. Not necessarily do you have to swap over. It's not that you're swapping over. It's you're making small incremental adjustments and you're learning. And so once it, they learn, like I said, most of the time, they're already here in their pitch anyway. So you're not changing anything. You're actually just changing their warm up. And so teaching them to warm up differently is not going to affect them during a game. And so I would actually get in, start watching the video, start understanding, start letting it make clarity. So that when you do start making those adjustments or start doing the drills, you already know it. Like having the time to go through those videos is the most work. Not not actually doing the program. It's watching the videos, understanding it. And it's I can't I can't tell you enough like how many times is when that light bulb, then when that light bulb bulb cut cuts on and they're like, oh, I get it. Or when you've been fighting something for so long, like why does my kid keep dragging out? We've been to eight instructors and she's still dragging out. You're going to know immediately why, like when you're in there and you're going to be like, these are the answers that I've been looking for for eight years and nobody can answer. So like, I can't tell you how much clarity will come out of the teachings. And that's what I hear from most of my kids that are in there and the kids that come see me um y'all are so welcome thanks for being here with me I hope this helps you guys I'm trying to see where I miss, miss, miss uh okay what do I do as a minor coach with one pitcher resisting uh resistant to switching um I think you just need to explain to her the benefits of it I think just like I did today it's like you don't have to switch but here are all the reasons why you need to. Here's the here's the pros and cons and let them figure it out. They're only scared of switching because they think it's probably going to um, uh, mess up their pitching and it only is going to make them better. And anytime we try to get better, there's going to be some down when we go up. So they've got to know that, that, you know, and not everybody goes down. Some people just get it and go. And it's great. Every kid's a little different. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. If y'all have any questions, you can reach out to me on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, um, okay. Y'all, you're so sweet. Thank you so much. Um, 
Okay, Vegas is when I'm going to Utah. I don't have a camp, but I'm going to be flying into Vegas. Um, I actually talked to Danielle Spalding about having a clinic. I don't know if you know her. You can find her on Instagram. She's a friend of mine. You can ask and say, hey, I heard Foster Fast Bitch was coming. Are you going to be hosting her or whatever? I talked to her about it. But if you want to do something, it might be something where I can meet you. So just message me. Um, how long did it take me to change my philosophy? Um, well, remember it was kind of gradual for me because nobody, it wasn't really a philosophy. It was, I'm hurt. And if I don't change, uh, I'm, I'm going to be done. So it was one of these, I'll do whatever it takes to try to see if I can continue pitch three more years in college and not be hurt. So I was trying to just get through without being hurt. Um, so I think once I was able to do it and I realized the change and what it brought was like, there's something here. And I'm the only one that's been teaching this for years and years and years here in Birmingham. And I think I'm probably one of the only ones that's been teaching it all around. Um, I would say maybe 10 coaches all around the United States probably been teaching this way for a long time. So most coaches have been doing the other ways. And I, I don't think it was necessarily something that was actually taught to them. Um, I think it's, it's just evolved over time, but, uh, is there a wait list for the Utah clinic? Yes, there is, um, a wait list. And if you will message me, I will give you the instructor's information and you can send her a message. Um, and it may be a, something where I can do is if she can't get in there, I might can do something one-on-one -on -one with her the day before. Um, Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. How much should they practice per week versus rest? Well, it's all different during seasons. And then during the fall, we're going to start doing some bullpen stuff. So you guys know, but during the season, you try to have one full day of total rest. Um, but um, the days that they pitch outside of their games, most of my kids are doing drills and 10 of each pitch. So they're not doing a full day of pitching a day before a game because most of them will have off on Sunday. They play on Monday. They play on Tuesday, off on Wednesday, play Thursday, and then they have a tournament. So that, you know, they don't even really have time to practice during the season. So, um, but during the fall, I'd say at the most three days off. Um, but during the fall is when we're heavily working and heavily lifting. That's when you get better. Um, they take December off and then come back. So it's, it all is really, it's, it determines like, what are their goals? What season are they in? Um, but they do need at least one rest day during the season. How would you address parents who have pitching coaches um, that teach hello of, oh, you really don't have to address them because when your kid starts um, doing tremendously better and you have some weird drills that they're not doing, they're going to ask questions. Um, a lot of my, I mean, most of my kids that come in here are from some other kid. Like we've just seen how much she's grown in the last three months. And we're like, um, oh my goodness. And we want you to look at mine. And I posted a girl on my stories today. That was one of those. She's been here four weeks and she's went from dragging straight out to almost getting that complete sequence down in four weeks. And this in the middle of the season. And he's like, I'm amazed. He said, y'all may not be able to see, but I can totally see the difference. Um, Yes. Um, okay. Let me know about that. Cause I may do a couple of days in Houston. Um, is it Desiree? Just send me a message. Um, I know softball doctor, I'll probably do some stuff with her. Um, and then Kristen, I'll do some stuff with her. Like I said, I can't remember the name of her business. And, um, so I may just spend a couple of days out there and I can do something with you as well if we need to. So, um, anyway, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you guys so much. I've enjoyed being here with you guys. Um, I really appreciate you and thank you all for listening. And I hope that was um, valuable and it helped you out. And like I said, be looking for the email if you want it. And, um, you'll have the zoom call you can share with other people, share with your pitching coaches. Um, they can reach out to me, um, whatever. So I hope you'll have a wonderful Sunday and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.